Hey, this is Brandon Vietti, one of the producers of Young Justice, and you're listening to Whelm, the Young Justice Files. Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello team, and welcome to Scream Something, Volume 11. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co-host, Producer Neil. Hey everyone, in Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 4 that were released over the last two Thursdays. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes I think, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdowns we have planned after the season finale. Nice work, Cam. They might not have found Superboy in time without you. And Beast Boy? I thought we weren't supposed to intervene on anything. Except, you know, the one big thing. The history books don't mention this incident one way or another. Maybe we always intervened? And with that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles for this week's episodes were Volatile and Involuntary. The release dates were October 21st and 28th of 2021. The in-episode dates were March 24th and 25th. The directors were Christina Soda and Christopher Berkeley, and the writers were Brandon Vietti and Francisco Paredes. Just in time for your next mission. Episode 3 opens with a flashback to Beast Boy and the Outsiders taking down the Cult of Cobra before we cut back to the present on Mars where Beast Boy is missing his team and still clearly struggling mentally, that poor boy. After the credits, Prince Jem arrives at the Moors residence to see if everyone's okay after that cave-in last episode, and Miss Martian informs him that the attack on her, Superboy, and Beast Boy was probably connected to the destruction of the Zeta Tube, though not necessarily to the death of the king, because this is a convoluted mystery for us to unravel. McGann then introduces everybody to Baby Bioship, the cutest little spaceship you have ever seen, who takes Connor and Gar to the palace to investigate the place where King Saturn's body was found. However, the only additional evidence Connor is able to find is a strange but familiar something that he can't quite place. To express his gratitude for their help with the investigation, Prince Jem volunteers to help with the construction of Connor's wedding altar. Meanwhile, off with the bridal party, we're informed that Bioship is retiring. Ow, my heart. Uh, and that baby Bioship will apparently be returning to Earth in her place. We also get the very sweet story of how McGann first bonded with Bioship, and I'm fine. Elsewhere on Mars, Beast Boy is having flashbacks to when Brion betrayed the Outsiders and his uncle, but that's interrupted by the group meeting up with Ba'ar's Aum, the Green Beetle from Season 2, which Loved this whole scene. Garfield tries to insist that Connor needs to go up to the surface to recharge his powers. But Connor says there's no hurry and the boys head off to go build an altar in a lava pit. Meanwhile, the gals are building the crystal canopy with telekinesis. And McGann has a private conversation with Soraya about her past with Prince Jim. Turns out she's who he almost married. In the middle of building their wedding altar, Beast Boy starts hallucinating a murderous Brion, and attempts to save Connor from him by taking him up to the surface of Mars, where it is still having a terrible dust storm. It does not go well. McGann and company finish building the canopy, and then McGann and her sister Emery get into a fight about, well, everything they've been clashing about all of these episodes. They destroy the canopy, but seem to reconcile at least somewhat and return to building. Meanwhile, Beast Boy is trying to save Connor, but nearly kills him by stranding him in the sandstorm on the surface of Mars. But thankfully, the Martian boys find him just in time. Beast Boy has a breakdown in the sandstorm, but McGann enters his mind and heals the psychic damage inflicted on him by the Martian mob in the episode one, but also encourages him to get some serious help for his other mental health problem. And he's then found and rescued by Prince Jim, but the plot twist, Beast Boy wasn't healed by McGann, but by Saturn Girl, who apparently went off, went a bit off mission to help him. 
Episode four then opens with an emotional goodbye between McGann and friends and Bioship uh, before cutting over to Macomb hiding the apocalyptic gene bomb under the new arena at the palace. Ah, McGann attempts to have a heart to heart conversation with him later, which goes about as well as you'd expect. Emery has a heart to heart conversation with Soraya, which goes far better. The Legion's still lurking around here somewhere. And <laughs> McGann, Connor, and Gar continue their investigation into King Saturn's death. Eventually, speaking with an Aashen servant who reveals that their prime suspect was actually a green Martian posing as a white Martian for reasons yet to be revealed. <laughs> Next, our trio of heroes arrives at Prince Jem's birthday celebration and tells him what they've learned, only for Jem to run off. That's when Superboy has a realization. What he saw at the crime scene was actually magical residue from a Martian sorcerer's spell. And then all of the pieces fall into place. Jem confronts Soraya, quickly followed by our heroes, and after briefly losing control of her magic, she confesses to accidentally killing the king. Uh, when he refused to listen to her plead her case for why she should be allowed to marry the prince, she got upset and lost control of her magic, accidentally murdering the king of Mars. <laughs> she escaped the palace and soon after joined the sorcerer priesthood to live a solitary life and hide what she'd done from Jem. Soraya is arrested, and news of her confession travels quickly, as everything else does, among the Martians, while rest the royal advisor attempts to spin the information as proof of the need of the caste system. Jim steps up to denounce the state of Martian racism and vows to change the planet, and the celebration continues. Uh, with Martian Manhunter and Superman even finally arriving on Mars. Uh, thankfully, they took a much faster ship to get there, but there's still five minutes left in the episode. So, ooh, and this is why I have it. That mysterious man floating around in an invisible sphere tampers with the gene bomb. Macomb placed earlier in the episode, and his presence draws the attention of both the Legion and Superboy. Our heroes investigate, realize exactly what the weapon is, and everybody springs into action. Miss Martian successfully evacuates the stadium, and Superboy is able to destroy the virus in an underground lava pool, but isn't able to escape before the bomb explodes. In Connor's weakened state from the lack of sunlight, plus the added presence of kryptonite in the blast, it appears that Superboy was killed in action, and everyone cries forever. And on that note, let's Let's share some master. Yay. Good thing that clip's from Superboy. Superboy, are you all right? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. Okay, so we, should we go in chronological order or order of sadness? Uh, I don't know. We generally go in chronological order. Uh. Okay, chronological order. You have the same thing I do, which is Bioship leaving is sad. Bioship leaving is sad. It makes perfect sense, and I'm happy for this <laughs> faceless, speech speechless uh, spaceship from another planet to go live her retirement happily. But also, it hurts a lot. I didn't expect to have that thrown in with this arc, too, even though it made sense and it was a cool choice. It just, it, anyone who has, like, had a pet for a long time, I feel like, understands mm. that scene on a level that is just like ow okay okay we'll get through this yeah and it's interesting to think you know gar mentions like did or house forge are gonna take it and you know i had alluded to the idea that i think he knew and i think he knew because of how sad he seems in that first episode so i think he did know obviously mcgann was not informed until they're just like striving to go make the canopy which i'm like wow it's a weird moment bioship to decide to just drop that on her but bioship has had a busy day she has maybe doesn't have the best timing she's trying her best it's not the it's not necessarily the end of the story either for bioship because she's just choosing to live out the rest of her days yes. here on mars and i also enjoyed that the official name I mean, only because I've seen Brandon Vietti post it other places, is that it it's just called Baby. It's Baby Bioship. I <laughs> I deeply love, I have joked about this, talking about this, that Baby Bioship was introduced and every fan went, ah, 
baby Bioship, so precious. And it was very funny to see that every single character on this show reacted with that same kind of like baby Yoda energy, I think you said, mm-hmm. of like, we're just going to call this exactly what it is and we're not going to give it a real name, quote unquote real name. Yeah. Uh, and I love it. I love her. She is precious. Never thought I'd be calling a spaceship uh, adorable and precious, but she is. And I look forward to seeing her grow as she is a young justice and will grow into a strong, strong spaceship. Hee <laughs> <laughs> I'm ticklish. Also, I have giant guns. I love her. I love her already. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, you know, in the continued development of more and more Mars related things is that this was Bioship's tribe. But all things considered, it was fairly small given the idea of what we think the population of Mars is. And seemingly like as you pan through, you can clearly see in the background Bioship's parked at like everyone's house. Like even in the scene where Bioship is leaving, like on the like level just above there, there's a, another bioship if you will parked right there just sitting so the idea that like there are tribes like this all throughout mars i don't know it was just super cool martian lore is fun speaking of other martian stuff just speaking more about bioship because my notes are always in chronological order i really loved the moment on bioship where mcgann's mom is just being supportive and kind and her just saying that she's sorry that McGann felt like she had to run away but that she understands it just felt very I don't know just honest and good and mature and after so many seasons of us not knowing what Miss Martian's home life was like I Mm. like that this season has been going in a very complicated complex way of showing that like McGann's parents loved her and she was just in an impossible situation and dealing with things as best she could as a teenage child and just getting to see that moment of us getting to see her mom kind of be like I I get it and I'm sorry that kind of feels implicit in everything but it's nice to see it explicitly stated good scene I mean because we just didn't know until now yeah. where you could have easily assumed that it was because of her very her very specific home life was her reason for leaving mars only to find out like oh no it's just all of mars and because everyone can just psychically be mean to you <laughs> it's very difficult to just not have that experience all the time how do you avoid it you don't you run away to another planet <laughs> and then you deal with those consequences a long time later. But speaking, just speaking of Mars, all of half my notes on the first episode are just like, Mars is cool. Because it is. I love the little Martian wedding traditions because they're just, it's cute and it's fun and it's interesting and it's different. But I do think it is very funny that it's like, the bridal party is like, calmly build a very symbolic and beautiful piece of thing to be part of this ceremony that represents connection and family and all of these things and the groom has to like walk into a literal pit of fire and be like prove your devotion to your to your future wife which is so epic because it's just like you guys went into a lava pit you hate fire (laughs) yes why it's like and not you're actively using telekinesis to move lava what is happening like how did how did this start? Uh cuz that one I feel like doesn't get as much like explanation of the symbolic meaning of it just we all just go with it. It looks cool and it feels like a very much like prove your devotion to this relationship kind of thing, like old school like chivalric quest to win win the heart of your person. Well, the other thing for me was that whole altar also has to move at some point. That's not where it stayed. The whole giant thing got moved at some point. Later. Yeah. Off screen. But I do, I like that. There's so much from this episode that we're going to dive into when we do full episodes. But to call out one thing, I really liked Matt's line about where he's talking about how Martian Manhunter like went to Earth and understood things and came back and was all of this stuff. And Superboy says something like, I'm so glad he learned learned tolerance on Earth. And Matt says, he did not simply learn tolerance. That is insufficient. He learned acceptance and empathy. And 
hearing that explicitly stated in all of the symbolicness of this whole Martian conflict mm-hmm. and everything is very good and very important. And I really liked it because it's true and it's important. And it's important not only in superhero Martian racism ending revolutions and such. It is important in real life outside of our superhero cartoons. And it's important to remember. And I liked it. Yeah. I mean, if you look at that group, and I'm only doing this now, in the moment, like how ridiculous of a group it truly is, because you have a, a green who's been married to a white. You have Jim, who you know, a red who wanted to marry a green. You have Gar, who has Martian blood throwing, flowing through his veins. Then you have Connor, who's trying to marry basically a Martian which indoctrinates you, not indoctrinates you, but connects you to both the family and the entire Martian race. It's like these, look at this, like, look at this group, like go save the world. Go save Two worlds, the world, preferably. Buddy. Go save every world. It's fine. <laughs> this is fine. And also to talk about the other uh, group doing the other w- wedding preparations, I really loved the scene between McGann and Emery where they have this, where everything the past couple of episodes of them just kind of awkwardly glaring at each other and not saying things finally gets said. Uh, And I love it, not just because McGann makes the exact same argument I did about Emery's name change almost word for word in a moment that was very funny to me sitting there going, I said exactly that to several people (laughs) the other day. Oh, because we had a whole conversation on our Discord where I made that whole argument and then heard McGann make exactly that argument and was like, huh, glad to know I was right about (laughs) something. Um, I concur. Yes. But it's just such a real and honest and emotional and good moment of having that. And we've said it before a million times of the show does a really good job of presenting family relationships that are complicated in ways that make sense. Like there is that moment where everybody kind of somebody's like the fact that you guys are even having this conversation means that you care about each other. And I think on some level it does because it's they're they're willing to have that conversation instead of just like cutting each other off completely, which is what happened to McGann's mom. Uh, (laughs) And it's done really well and has some, cool real world connections and stuff like i really loved the moment where joanne like accepts and acknowledges that mcgann's like humanoid form that we see so often is her true form quote unquote like the language of the show is trying to figure out how do we explain this and i like that but it's just so good and cathartic and after so many seasons of so many people like having that conversation with her and like, what does this mean? And very, and people trying to figure out like, well, is McGann just like lying to people or is it cause she's been on earth for so long or whatever it might be. And having this moment where her mom like just realizes and accepts like, Oh, literally psychically, spiritually, however you want to interpret that this is who you are. And like we had that little there's a little moment in season three that kind of sets that up where there's a moment where her and McCom are having or McGann and McCom are having like a psychic conversation. And he says something like, look, you're even lying to yourself in your own head or something like that because she's Mm. in her humanoid form. And she's just like, we're not even going to talk about that right now and brushes past it. But seeing that kind of acknowledged as like this isn't a costume for McGann or anything like that. This is just who she is and the way that like her and Emery clash over what it means to be true to who you are and all of that is interesting and good and I like that bit of understanding between her and her mom even if her sister is still kind of trying to catch up yeah and but the other thing I noticed is that there are there have been some critiques here and there online about basically because everyone's talking telepathically that the animation isn't as move doesn't move as much as previous seasons. But it's like, well, yeah, because I don't know if you've noticed, but like there is a concerted effort always by this team from from the way I view it as doing things when they need to be done and not when they don't. 
because while a lot of lip movement and things aren't happening because they're talking telepathically, they still take that moment to cut over to Joan and watch her react. Yeah. Yep. And and at, basically have that motion and that sound when again trans, you know transitions into the the more white Martian form and just be surprised. It's like yeah. And so they use the stills when it's a flashback because it's a flashback. It's supposed to look different. They fade the blur when it's the like special psychic conversation. You know, everything is done with a choice. Um, so, yeah, I'm just throwing that out there. Again, those small moments are really interesting to see because they're put in there intentionally. It's a good scene emotionally, and it's a good scene in the way that it's executed. And I like it. I also, speaking of other other characters having problems uh i like the balance that they ended up striking between beast boys like mental health issues in this arc Mm -hmm. being both a result of his trauma and an added outside pressure because i know in our last scream something we kind of talked about that where i was like it would feel kind of false to me to have beast boy be this see like i don't know what the right word i'm looking for but seemed this I don't want to say unstable, but you know what I mean? Like this emotionally mm-hmm. affected by these things in a show that has done so much of like, we are showing characters getting therapy. We are showing people working through stuff. And while I know that like trauma is not a straight line and recovery is not a straight line, they have done such a good job of showing these characters move and grow. And so I liked the fact that they were showing that like Beast Boy was struggling a little bit and then got to Mars, had outside things happen to him that messed him up more. And that's why these things escalated so quickly over the last couple of episodes in a way that once you know that, I'm like, oh, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense to me. And I feel like it works. Similar to how you mentioned like, oh, this is the same conversation that McGann is having now. I was like, yes, this is the conversation I just had. Like he totally got, you know, the, the term used in the episode is psychically bruised. But it's like you said, it like brought all of that. I mean, because that's, oh, wow. This, I don't intend sometimes for the words I say to sound deeper than they are. I really don't. But, but the idea of like, that's the whole point of a bruise. It's literally drawing that blood to the surface and that's what you see. So he's psychically bruised. So those things that he was able to push down further and cover up with being busy, I mean, ridiculously busy, are now there and now need to be addressed. This show is good. Who would have guessed? Uh, still speaking of Beast Boy, that scene of him saying goodbye to Bioship and like welcoming baby Bioship into the group is very sweet. And it's nice that we have that moment that shows that he has clearly that him getting healed is helping him a little bit because he's able to kind of have that conversation and express it. And later in the next episode, when we have like everybody like officially saying goodbye to Bioship and it made me sad and I cry. Uh, it's nice to see him especially, but all of them kind of have that conversation of like, these are emotions and we accept them and deal with them. And just getting to see Beast Boy kind of say like, I'm sad you're leaving, but also I'm happy to welcome baby Bioship to our family and showing that he has grown from being healed and realizing he needs to acknowledge some trauma even in just the small way of being able to have that conversation is nice. Oh, the hilarious line of easy snapper. And I couldn't figure out if it was just because he like what he was doing or like some weird jab at snapper car. Does snapper car snap a lot? I don't know. I just (laughs) couldn't figure it out. And it just made me laugh trying to figure that out. Um, final thing from episode three, uh, I loved it in the trailer, and I loved it even more seeing it in the episode. Uh, very cute kiss between Superboy and Miss Martian at the end of this episode. Uh, storyboarded by Kelly Ko, I think is how I pronounce that. Uh, she tweeted about it online and was very excited that she got to storyboard a, storyboard a kiss for Young Justice, and I thought that was very cute, and I just thought it was a very, very adorable scene. 10 out of 10. Yes. But that's all I really have to say about episode 3. <laughs> Okay, episode three, to go all the way back to the first scene, I absolutely loved the Outsiders flashback. Yeah. That's kind of all I got. It was just nice to see them. Um, And then you got to see Stargirl. You got to see Windfall. We got to see Tim and Cassie. 
So for you Wonderbird fans out there, that's that, there you go. Um, neither of them said anything at all, and they weren't even taking the picture next to each other. So I don't know, a glass case of emotion for you, I'm sure. All those devoted Wonderbird fans mm-hmm. looking for all the crumbs they can possibly find. Yep. <laughs> valid. You are all valid. So episode four. I'll be honest, I don't have a lot of notes on this one that aren't uh, crashing the mode because this episode just wrapped up a bunch of stuff really well and then uh, punched me in the heart and told me to deal with it. So so I can jump in. One of, go for it. One of the most interesting things to me is, and it certainly seems to be a theme throughout, is that, is that there are... So, okay, we're going to go one step back in my mind before we can go forward. What I find interesting is that my preconceived assumptions were the idea that secrets within the team would come back up. But it just is like this revolutionary thing of like, oh, no, no, other people can have secrets. The team can choose to grow and stop lying to each other this season. That'd be great. But the idea that everyone else is just hiding and lying all the time is what I think we might go with as an alternative. Because, like, how is Macomb hiding from everyone? How is old Bubble Boy hiding from everyone? How do you, you, you were, like, two feet away from people. Connor didn't even know you were there until, like, you made a noise. And then, like, all of the other legionnaires, like, all the legionnaires are hiding all the time. I just can't figure it out. That's just me. Secrets. Secrets and lies, man. Secrets and lies. <laughs> I wonder if that's a Young Justice theme. It might be. My main note for this episode, the thing I thought was really cool and really interesting, because I have loved all of the Martian world building going on, is uh, Car Mang introduced as this side character to just give us a glimpse into like the other side of Martian life and mm. Martian culture that we haven't really seen. And just every bit of that from just the design on him to them kind of walking into like the white Martian neighborhood and commenting on how like Beast Boy is kind of surprised of like, oh, it's really cramped here. And Miss Martian is just like, yeah, this is how we had to live and deal with that. And nobody really acknowledged or paid attention to it and all of those things. And I really liked how they show that at least Carmang and possibly other white Martians have a very different Martian perspective about McGann and the Outsiders than we've seen from most of Mars so far, Uh, especially after seeing them get so much hate psychically thrown at them. It was cool Cool. to see him immediately know who they are and be willing to talk to them and him even saying when they're like, why are you telling us this? And Car says, because she's one of us. Like that level of being able to be like, I can trust you with this information because I know you're not going to work against us kind of thing is good and interesting, especially after we had so fully established like what the Mar- the overall seeming Martian perspective was on things to get the, the Ashen perspective on this whole little group it was very cool, even if it's a very short scene. <laughs> well, yeah, and I loved how they got there as well, like that Mind Palace style review of the facts. I was just a big fan of because it's like, well, yeah, I mean, everything happens different. And again, it's that Martian culture of like everything happens differently because you have access to all this psychic knowledge. And like basically looking back through like the psychic, what I want to say, file cabinet, if you will, of like these records and comparing things. The other thing of note was, like you said, the design, but like choosing to have a scar. Yeah. Then my other thought that I put in the notes was like, can Martians scar? And if not, like the intentionality of that choice is no small thing. He says, I keep this for a reason. He literally says that to her, which to me implies you could just hide that or on some level, like the the rabbit hole we could dive down of like, what does that mean? How does Martian uh, shapeshifting translate to healing, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is its own rabbit hole that I am not equipped to go anywhere near. Uh, but even just that small intentional thing is very cool. I also, I also like, so I will just read my note, how I wrote it because I am entertained by my own note. Uh, and with that, 
The king's death had nothing to do with the Mars Earth satellite and Zeta 2 blowing up, which also has nothing to do with the bomb that Macomb was setting. What an intricate web you weave, Greg and Brandon. An intricate web, indeed. Uh, Because, no, but it is, it's very good and very interesting, I think, to see, especially in a superhero show, where so often the kind of plot tie up for everything is like it's all connected look at how everything was part of the same plot and we know exactly who did it and we can take them down and it's nice seeing on this show that for at least this arc the solution was there are just a lot of problems all at once all the time mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah the idea that you have the expanse of the entire dc universe involved and everything happened all together for all the same reasons and like they are all still connected by all of the various threads of being part of the larger conflict on the planet of like king saturn's death was a result of the same caste system and martian Mm. racism problems that are fueling macomb's decisions that are related to like the creation of the Zeta tube and stuff like that, though their destruction is a separate problem, but it's the way that they're all, they are all still weaved together, even if they are, Mm -hmm. they all have different reasons for happening and they're not all the cause of one big enemy, but they do connect. And that's, it's an intricate web. We enjoy it. Indeed. Well, like you said, it all unravels with, with that, that cast system and the way it's functioned thus far on Mars um, has definitely caused quite a great deal of problems. Um, And also errant uh, magic, just going everywhere and being very bad um, when it happened. You gotta learn to control your magic. When you're dating somebody, you need to still make time to practice the things that keep you and others safe from your magical superpowers. This is Emily's superhero dating advice column. This is a PSA for everyone out there. Yeah. It's awesome. But I think that's basically all I got to say. It's the thing of like once once we once we get further out from this episode, I'm sure I'll have more to say. It's just that right now most of my notes and reaction to this episode were I'm sad. You've you've wrapped up three interesting mysteries and created new ones. You've caused various uh, interesting arcs and conversations to unfold, but uh, I'm sad. So, yes. So that final scene is going to circle us, I think, into crashing the mode quite a bit. So I'm ready to crash. If you're ready to crash, let's crash. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In Crashing the Mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. This Crashing the Mode is based on episodes one through four and the trailer and possibly a little bit of episode five if we feel like it. Okay, so ever since the last, ep- the last scene of four, I have had a meme in my head and... The meme goes as such. The chances of Connor being dead forever are low, but never zero. I'm just saying. Neil, I need you to get out right now. I need you to just leave the podcast. Stay whelmed, everyone. This this is a joke, and you're wonderful. I just, I, (laughs) as I have written in my notes here, so Connor's not dead because I say so, but... Uh, but actually, my actual reasons for this, as people debate and argue on the internet, and I know not, some people are convinced he's dead, a lot of people aren't, I know there's many a fan theory, all of that, I'm sure. My take on this, my literal evidence is that I think the Legion got him, uh, we don't see a body, and after that moment, we don't see the Legion again. And from my perspective, if you are telling the story in a way where you want us to really, really believe that Connor is definitely dead, you would drive that idea home by showing the Legion lamenting the fact that they didn't do what they were supposed to. Because it seems clear to me that the Legion was there to 
either stop this bomb or save Superboy, one or the other, or some combination of both. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted to convince me Connor is definitely dead, the easiest way to do that would be to show the Legion going, oh, God, I can't believe we didn't get to him in time, blah, 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 which they don't do. They just show all of our favorite, favorite Martian family crying uh, and hurting my heart. Yeah, so, I mean, I obviously... I do truly believe the meme that I said that the chances of him actually being permanently dead are very low, but given the show, it is greater than zero. Now that said, with the power set of the three legionnaires that we have, what I think is the cause for the shadow is them blocking him from the explosion. And so, like, that's basically how those shadows are created in the, in the instance of something happening that is very bright. Basically, whatever stopped that light then creates the shadow on those objects. Um, so the idea that Chameleon Boy could have transformed into something, um, Phantom Girl could have used her powers. So that is, that is certainly my theory, is that they stopped it. And then took him to the future? Maybe. We'll because find out. it's kind of not there at least yeah we'll find out that's, i mean that's that's kind of how the story goes is that they take superboy to the future to help inspire and make the legion uh-huh we've been saying that my more figurative storytelling reason for thinking that superboy is not dead if i set aside all of my textual evidence and just go on the vibes here for a second <laughs> And how stories function is I am a person who deeply believes in hopeful storytelling. And I'd like to think that the whole creative team involved with making Young Justice is smart enough and creative enough to not fall into the trap that I feel like a lot of media has. That is like this idea that it needs to be hopeless or pointless that death in media needs to be hopeless or pointless and full of darkness for the sake of like presenting a serious and mature story, which I deeply disagree with. So from my perspective, watching this episode in the larger context of the show, unless <laughs> the message that's coming across here is like, this world is dark and hopeless and no one, no matter how well-intentioned or noble, can earn their happy ending, like... If that's not what we're going for here, then I don't think there's a reason to actually kill off Superboy four episodes into the season uh, when we've set up reasons for that not to happen. And I know that that is an emotional response and people may disagree with that and that's fine. The added thing, I will say this, the added thing at the end of episode five of quoting the Tale of Two Cities over Connor, like that added more hope and emotionality for me to his death than and made it feel less <laughs> less pointlessly sad and hopeless but still i'm like bring this boy back because he is he has worked so hard and he deserves a good ending <laughs> yeah, and even if i mean you're not i'm only playing the dead devil's advocate even if he were to not come back connor gave up his life to literally save an entire planet. Yes. Ninjas. Yes. And everything about that, I mean, because everything about that, even if let's say it only worked in that area, you know, cause we don't know the yield of the bomb, blah, blah, blah. And which is obviously we don't need to know because it, it didn't happen, but if it didn't happen to wipe out all greens and all reds, then those racial tensions and that caste system would have only gone even farther because it was done by Macomb. I'm not saying I'm not saying he's he's dead, but also can we talk about the arc structure and us having theoretically no idea when we would see more information about this? Yeah, we've we've <sighs> watched episode five, and episode five is set after episode four, and we are dealing with the fallout from that. Day. It's yeah, it's and a we, single day after, and we're still we still don't know when we'll touch on these particular characters again because even mm -hmm. though. What happened to Connor is a big force in episode five. We have yet to actually like see Miss Martian there. Uh, and I don't think we will for a bit. I don't know what she's doing, but I think it'll be a bit. 
to real quick. Like, as I said, like, I feel like episode five contextualized episode four a little bit more for me Mm. and made me less emotionally distraught and a little bit angry than I was when I like wrote these uh, these notes immediately following episode four pretty soon after. And I was just like, this is pointless. Why it's got bro- all of this just being annoyed about it. And that's because sadness and anger are closely linked and I just want this good boy to be okay. But getting that fuller context and seeing the aftermath and having the quoting the tale of two cities speech at the end kind of i was like oh yeah that is that that does make a lot of sense of like superboy wanting to protect everyone and all that and seeing what his actions could lead to and i'm like oh okay i'll i'll move into the acceptance stage even though i still don't think he's dead uh (laughs) i'll move into the acceptance stage of my fictional grief uh well, and, yeah, one of the other things I've noted is that online there there seems to be some assumptions about the idea that the arcs are four episodes, which we have no bearing on that. Yeah. Um, whether that's true, false, or everywhere in between, because for all we know, because again, there's an intentionality of the story dictating what happens. Like, the, you know, Greg and Brandon have always been really forthcoming of this base, you know, this base. Basically, this story is going to tell us what we are going to do, and then we will do that. So it could be four, and the next one could be three. Because the other thing is there's supposed to be a mid-season break at 13, yeah. which I've I've recently discovered using Math Magician uh, skills. That, yeah, that's not divisible by four. So Yeah. So it's like we'd either be splitting in the middle of an arc, or some of these arcs are different episode lengths length number of episodes we'll just have to wait and see yeah it'll be interesting to see where that all um shapes up when we will learn more um about the legion maybe maybe because i know some people people who know more about the legion than i do including you have some theories on who one of these characters might be yes so rich Good old Rich mentioned the idea that it may be Invisible Boy. And so I've been reading some Legion comics from years gone by. What I have noted is that the older style of writing is very convenient for a person who has not read much of the Legion because they constantly use each other's names. Um, it's, it just does feel kind of, you know, has a little bit of that vibe of an older style of writing. But it, like I said, it is extremely helpful. <laughs> because they're like, hey, chameleon boy, let's go do this. And I'm like, aha, okay, now I know who, who this person is. But invisible boy, specifically the idea of the second invisible boy, because the first one and the second one basically drank a liquid that gave them that power. And in the story arc that I'm reading, and I don't know if there's any credence to this, but the idea is that it was a specific story arc that was presented by the DC Infinite app that I started reading that's about Darkseid involving himself directly with fighting the Legion. And then it just so happens that Rich mentions Invisible Boy and this is the origin story for the second Invisible Boy. And this is just me wearing a giant tinfoil hat. <laughs> so, yes. Possible. So, you to, to sum up, you and Rich think that the guy in the time sphere or whatever they call it is is possibly invisible boy from the legion from the future yes because things don't go well because basically his involvement with the legion involves brainiac trying to save his sister and accidentally uploading computo into her who turns her into a monster who almost kills most of the legion and possibly the whole world in that arc that i was reading um, so I can imagine that if things go a little bit awry, um, that this person would then be very disgruntled. At the same time, it could be somebody I don't even know. We'll find out eventually the motto of this season of Young Justice. My other crash in the mode side note that occurred to me when rewatching these episodes and writing notes is I'm pretty sure that Invisible Boy or whoever it is that tampered with the bomb is who added the kryptonite to this situation. I think Mm -hmm. it's safe to maybe assume that whatever that weird little box was that got placed on the bomb that nobody noticed wasn't supposed to be there was full of kryptonite. But 
McGann and Garfield don't know any of that because they have no knowledge that the bomb was tampered with. So my thought that I want to throw out into the universe today, apparently, is what is the likelihood of McGann assuming that McCom is responsible for that bit of this whole situation as well and go in like full Galadriel darkness on him Yeah, <laughs> to borrow a phrase from our actual play. <laughs> well, I mean, the last bit of information before it happens is that Gar licks it and says it tastes like Macom. So I find that to be very likely because you also have the, I mean, you have the scene where he says, um, say goodbye to mom and tell dad, I'm sorry. Um, you certainly don't have anything referring to Connor, but I, I mean, yes, I don't, I don't imagine in the state that she would find herself in, um, that rational thought would be readily available. Rightfully so. He does say good luck with the wedding as she's leaving, which Mm, if you want it, which again, I don't think McCom is responsible for this particular bit of the problem, but I can absolutely see McGann angry and devastated making some choices. And I want to hope she won't. I want to hope that we all heal and grow and don't attack other people over this thing and making assumptions. But I needed to share that fear with the world, that worry, that concern. (laughs) Agreed. Also, I think you had one more note here on a lighter note as we end this episode. I will make, yes, I will make it as light as possible because it is now the funniest option that I have. Who will bond with baby? And my answer is Martian Manhunter because he's still holding a grudge that McGann took Bioship. That's my answer. Official answer. That's your official answer? Um, Yes. I I don't think it's the real answer, but it makes me happy. Like, I feel like the obvious answer is McGann because she is sad and needs a comfort spaceship. And it seems to me on some level of the idea of Bioship kind of wanting to, if she was retiring, make sure that McGann was still like set up and taken care of on some level. Like there is a, there is a mutual level of care between those two characters. And I can absolutely see Bioship being like, here I am not, I am not leaving you abandoned. <laughs> Please take my child and do good. But I have also seen people discussing maybe, maybe Beast Boy, maybe. Ah, uh, so the Outsiders have a spaceship, I guess, or maybe Forager, cause Sad Boy. Oh. But I don't know. Again, we'll have to wait and see. I'm personally still leaning toward McGann, but any of those options would make sense. And if Martian Manhunter really just really, really wants a spaceship, that could also make sense. Hey, they took the last one. I'm just saying. (laughs) You snuck in, secretly bonded with my spaceship so you could run away to another planet. (laughs) Very sweet. I like that being the explanation. It's very cute. Um, But I think that's all of our mode to be crashed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And with that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at theyjfiles.tumblr.com, on our website, crashingthemode.com. And if that somehow isn't enough for you, you can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. As always, if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., as those are much harder to find. If you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. 
Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Thank you.